Hey everyone, if you love the show, you're going to absolutely love my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, a book that deals with the problems of general music education and highlights the many reasons that the system just turns children off from music for life. It's going to be a great read, very funny one, and many great people are coming together to endorse it. Also, consider becoming a supporting listener of The Nikhil Hogan Show on Patreon for exclusive perks, goodies, and access to our secret Facebook group. Finally, be sure to sign up to my mailing list on NikhilHogan.com for updates about the book. All right, on to the show. On today's show, we talk to the amazing Grammy award-winning classical guitar virtuoso, Jason Vio, about his background, his development as a player, his views on music, arranging, improvisation, his collaborations with Pat Metheny, and so much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Nikhil Hogan Show, the best music interview show you're going to find. We certainly don't disappoint in our guest selection. Today, we've got one of the best classical guitarists in the world today, Grammy Award winner Jason Vio. He has performed as a concert soloist with over 100 orchestras. Vio has taught at the Cleveland Institute of Music since 1997, heading the guitar department since 2001. He has received a Nomberg Foundation Top Prize, a Cleveland Institute of Music Distinguished Alumni Award, the Guitar Foundation of America International Guitar Competition First Prize, and a Salon de Virtuosi Career Grant. Vio was the first classical musician to be featured on NPR's Tiny Desk series. In 2012, the Jason Vio School of Classical Guitar was launched with Artistworks Incorporated, an interface that provides one-on-one online study with Vio for guitar students around the world. In 2015, Vio won the Grammy for Best Classical Instrumental Solo for his album Play. Now, Pat Metheny has composed a four-movement suite for VO, which will be premiered later this year. And finally, Jason is in the midst of recording a new Bach album on the Zika Records. All of that and more we will discuss shortly. But first, Jason, great to have you on the show for the first time. Well, thank you, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Well, you've said that you've started playing the guitar at the young age of five and began classical guitar lessons at eight. Is that right? Yes, my uh, my mother bought me a guitar when I was five. I'm not sure how much playing I did, and I probably just goofed around on it now and then. Um, and I took some music reading lessons when I was six or seven in Buffalo from a jazz guitarist named uh, Joel Perry. And he um, basically was, we were using our guitars, he was using our guitars to to as a vehicle to teach Solfege, basically, and kind of you know, sort of the basic building blocks of of music. Um, not so much learning things to play, um, more like music uh, training lessons. And then the Buffalo Guitar Quartet came to my school, my elementary school, when I was seven, and, I, and right around my eighth birthday, I started with Jeremy Sparks, the classical uh, classical guitar lessons. Let me ask you something. You know, is your family a musical family? I mean, did your father or mother do they play instruments themselves? Well, as far as my background, I mean, it's um, we really have no connection to music or entertainment or or the arts. Um, in fact, my my family history in Buffalo is, uh, you know, quite uh, you know very much centered around uh, blue collar uh, lifestyle and 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 work. And, and factories and lake, laker boats and this kind of thing, you know, Buffalo, like Cleveland or Erie or Detroit, <clears throat> or any of those uh, towns on the Great Lakes, uh, there was uh, a very thriving industry, you know, two and three generations ago of uh, laker boats that would transport goods along the Great Lakes. And so my father's side, there's a long, as I like to say in interviews, a long line of coal passers. So my background really wasn't so much it had anything kind of connection to the arts or music. And uh, however, my father's side of the family, in particular, I think uh, there, that over the years I've learned that they were extremely musical, like being able to play instruments by ear. I always knew that my father, my father had a really very strong ear, and uh, and, and a love for music. 
when I started playing classical guitar, uh, he f- he immediately began, began uh, became a fan of classical music on the radio and listening to uh, WNED in Buffalo and and when I was in college, I realized as as my ear training at Cleveland Institute of Music was developing that he could pick out he would pick out um you know sort of ancillary lines in orchestral music and even identify the be able to identify the instrument that was playing it so i mean that's not something that everybody can do and like i said it would ha- my father would have had zero absolutely zero training or practice on any kind of musical instrument so i think it probably comes something from there um as far as kind of an aptitude for music. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Do you have perfect pitch? I do. Um, it's, uh, it's, but I think really perfect pitch is, is a kind of a, is kind of a buzzword in, in our, in culture that, uh, you know, where, but, you know, and, and, and in fact, it doesn't really, having perfect pitch, uh, as we've noticed in conservatory training, does not necessarily help, one identify uh, intervals or chord uh, progressions or the thing that does not actually help all that much all the time, depending on the person, with the identification of uh, and, and the, uh, the analysis of how music is put together, which in music theory is very important in order to become a complete musician. Actually having relative pitch or the, the ability to measure distances is a much more important uh, skill than than perfect pitch, but yes, I I, I realized in high school that I, I you know, I, so I it's very easy for me to hear a four forty in my ear, um, and I and I noticed also in high school that I could pick out harmonies and and even dense harmonies like singing groups like uh, Take Six, or you know this kind of thing, you know very complex jazz harmonies when I was in high school. You mentioned that you did solfege training. Now, were you doing fixed dough or was that movable dough? Oh, that's fixed dough at uh, Cleveland Institute of Music. Yeah, some places they have movable Oh, no, I mean, I remember you said you had a jazz guitar teacher who was doing solfege training with you as your first... Yeah, uh, that was like when I was like six years old. That was basically like being able to read and write. Like, I mean, I, my mother still has the notebooks. Like, when I'm wow. on of my six-year-old scrawling like a, a, a C major scale on a staff and writing <laughs> the words do, re, mi, fa, sol. I mean, I didn't, you know... I didn't really even know what that was, but I mean, it was basically like a very beginning of solfege training. And then I did learn to play these notes on the guitar, but that was the extent of my guitar playing at that point. Um, It was probably more, you know, and then in elementary school, I was in a recorder uh, group, you know, playing recorder and also in chorus. Uh, all the way through high school, and so my reading actually also in the public school systems were you know was strengthened by singing. Did you play any other instruments growing up? Was there a piano in your house? You mentioned the recorder. Was there other instruments you dabbled with? At some point when I was in middle school or high school, my mother um, bought had had found a very uh, cheap old piano uh, that she put in the living room with the intent of having the three of us kids, my older brother and younger sister and I, to take piano lessons on, which, which I enjoyed and, and, and did well. But my brother and sister didn't really enjoy taking lessons too much on it. So, um, so I took a little bit of piano there. And then, of course, at Cleveland Institute of Music, in order to graduate with your bachelor's degree, you have to pass uh, a two years. You have to take two years of piano and pass a certain level of proficiency. Um, after, so other than that, I mean, that was, I really, at that point, I was so deep into classical guitar, uh, that I really only practiced piano in order to just barely make the cut and get through the, uh, proficiency in order to graduate. <laughs> now, you mentioned in another interview that you've listened to an incredible amount of music growing up. Let me read you a quote that you gave. Musically, I'd say that my first musical exposure was to the Beatles, Seals and Crofts, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Super Tramp, and a whole lot of soul and R&B from the 60s, as well as modern jazz. That was when I was three years old and a, and a bit after, my parents' vinyl, basically. Can you describe the music that you listened to, the, the, the amount of records, and what really resonated with you from a young age? 
That uh, that statement is 100% accurate. Um, so, uh, I was at three, you know, when I was three years old, and you know, I would have, of course, been playing playing and and um, had, you know, with my brother and sister at home. My brother at that time, at point would already been in first grade. Um, but my favorite activity to do was to kind of sit in my in my room that I share with my brother and play with uh, my light bright and put one record on after the other. And my mo- and my mother noticing this then just went went into her closet or the attic and got all of her records out and uh, and sort of you know put is you know put them in front of me and. Which was great. It was like for me, it was like having Christmas every time she brought it, you know, brought out down new records, you know, and I would put these on. So yeah, my my earliest, my I, I would say my earliest two musical memories are the forty five singles of Proud Mary and Born on the Bayou by Creedence Clearwater Revival, and uh, a, a, the Stevie Wonder single. Um, not I was made to love her, although I was listening to that later a little bit later. Um, for once in my life, that's a very and, and Aretha Franklin respect. Those those three records are very early, probably my earliest memories. And then, so then the vinyl the LPs that my br- mother brought down were the Beatles, and then I kind of went crazy over that. <laughs> I mean, I, would, I used to tell my uncles and aunts, and you know, at four and five, you know, that the you know I I, I just talk about the Beatles, and uh, I you know in my mind they were still together. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, even though it was 1978, 79. I guess would it be fair to say that your first proper classical guitar teacher was Jeremy Sparks of the Buffalo Guitar Quartet? Yeah, I, I, he would. I would definitely say that 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 was the that was. I mean, now Joel Perry gave me some basics on on you know left hand shaping and this kind of thing and how to hold down a note and and that sort of thing. Um, but my first actual training, real training, weekly training on the guitar. A sustained weekly lesson with uh, very clear goals uh, was with uh, Jeremy Sparks, and I studied with him all the way from when I started with him, which was probably like a day after my eighth birthday, until I graduated from high school at 16. And so, and he was a very good, uh, very good foundation for me. It turned out, um, you know, as a teacher, now, you know, it's uh, it's you know having taught now for so long. Um, you know, you, sort of the older you get, the more you realize how important having a foundation like that was, and how lucky I was to have you know to to be studying with someone like that. I mean, I think sometimes people take that kind of thing for granted because they think like you know is in your in sort of like in your kid mind or your teenage mind, you think well everybody has access to something like that, and then of course you get out into the world, you know, and you you know fly. You know, two million miles around the world, and you realize it's not really the case. So it was. Uh, my mother made a very good. My mother was very proactive about my music. Tr- you know, my musical development. Now, let me read to you what you said. You said it wasn't until my classical guitar teacher Jeremy Sparks started training me at eight years old that I began to learn the language, not just the technique of playing and listening to classical music. Could you elaborate on that statement? Well, basically, the way what that statement implies is that we didn't have classical music records in the house when I was seven and eight years old, and that's basically true. There was a Bernstein, New, uh, Leonard Bernstein, New York Philharmonic recording of An American in Paris and uh, Rhapsody in Blue, um, and that was basically it. I mean, I the, we didn't because my dad was before that such a huge modern jazz fanatic. My dad. The only pop music my father enjoyed listening to was like Seals and Crofts because he liked the harmon he liked the harmonization of the two voices, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, so he could appreciate like basically like folk singers or singer songwriters, that kind of thing. But he was mainly a kind of an anti pop uh <laughs> anti pop music kind of an attitude. He really was. I mean he was he was very like, you know, uh, so, and are you talking about so, contemporary pop of the time? Because the Beatles were was oh, the time, yeah, contemporary pop of the time. Like he even kind of poo pooed the Beatles. Like he kind of, I mean, he was <laughs> like, well, you know, I remember asking him about him, like in disbelief. I was like, you know, I, I would, I, you know, in high school, I'd have played, you know, Sgt. Pepper or the White Album. I was like, Dad, you know, you you didn't dig this stuff when you were like, you know, when this <laughs> stuff was coming. He's like. He's like, well, yeah, the later stuff was was pretty good. <laughs> you know, but it was, he almost had this kind of sort of staunch anti-rock music attitude. You know? 
Um, <laughs> so wait, going back to my state now, what you're saying going back to the, Oh yeah. So really it was, I, again, you realize later on that I was learning about the language of classical music through the repertoire, through, you know, Mauro, studying, you know, doing studies by Fernando Sor, or Mauro Giuliani, um, you know, Fernando Sor studies were some of my earlier, earlier repertoire and Renaissance stuff. My, uh, Jeremy Sparks, my first teacher was very much into, uh, Renaissance era music and, uh, uh, and, and early Baroque and, and things like that. So, um, some of those easier pieces that you could, you know, I could handle at age, you know, nine and 10, uh, I would do it. I remember studying classical gas too. I remember my teacher would write write these all things out all by ear uh, from the record, and he he transcribed them from ear from the record uh, so that we didn't have to buy the sheet music because we I don't know we didn't there wasn't a lot of money in the household. Let's <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> now it appears to me that a lot of your interest was very self directed. Did your parents ever get on your case to practice, or was it always for you just a pleasure for you to do? Well, my parents, my my father loves to tell this story about. Um, he, 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 I've I've heard him tell lots of other, you know, classical guitar parents and this kind of thing. Because you know, of course, I'd these. What if I would play a concert with, a, you know, where they were at? There would always be a lot of you know people that would like to pick their brain about, how, you know, what it was like. And he and he said he would tell them the story. He said, "Oh yeah, he used to." We would, he'd say, oh, we'd be at my mother's house, you know, my, you know basically my grand, my grandmother's or my aunt's house. You, you know, he said, we'd be at, uh, you know, family, uh, uh, family member's house for a holiday for, you know, for Christmas or something. And he would come up to me and he'd, you know, be, uh, Jason would come up to me and say, oh, you know, dad, I only got one hour of practice in today. Are we going to, you know, what, what time do you think we're going to get home? <laughs> and see where this is going. <laughs> like I, I was, I had this kind of internal pressure on myself, you know, at uh, age eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Because I mean, a lot of that was probably more of a sense, an awareness of the time crunch, in the sense that there was a looming, you know, performance date, and I had to get you know such and such, you know, amount of pieces together. I think it probably came from that, which you know, I'm basically the same way today. Obviously, the volume is you know you know pretty pretty heavy, but like even in those days, like if I had if there was a date, I was I think I had a very good sort of sense of time organization, and I knew that I only had this amount of stuff to do. I wanted to you know uh, make hay while the the sun was sh you know still shining, as they say. Now, what age were you when you started to listen to records of John Williams, the classical guitarist, David Russell, and Julian Bream? Yeah, those guys, and you know, Christopher Parkening, Andre Segovia, the usual suspects uh, as well. I mean, those that, that was something around. Um, I would say I was like nine. I want to say nine or ten, and my Spanish teacher in my school uh, gave me a copy of as a present. Um, he, I think he was retiring, and he loved the fact that I was playing, that I was studying classical guitar, um, and I could play some simple pieces in this sort of thing. By the time I was nine or ten, I, you know, I remember coming to school. But my mother had, uh, was a secretary, you know, at that at that school. That's how you know we ran into Jeremy Sparks there because they did an outreach program there. But I remember going in and kind of playing for the librarian and and. His name was uh, Cobos, uh, and the Spanish teacher, and he gave me this cassette tape of John Williams, and that was the first, you know, recording that I we had. And then from there, Jeremy Sparks, my teacher, was then going to again because we just didn't have the money to buy records. We just there was there was really no disposable income in our in our household, so. The, so Jeremy would go to the, the the Buffalo Public Library system, and in those days you could take out all these vinyl LPs, and and so he'd bring like a a small stack of LPs over, and I'd start listening to those. Um, and also, I I used to, in those days, you know, like you did on the radio, you know, if you if you had a a, a boombox or a or a, a kind of a stereo system where you could record cassette tapes off of the the off of the uh, the turntable, 
you know, I was basically making cassette tapes off of those LPs as well. So, so I had a pretty, after a few years, I had a pretty pretty good cross-section of commercial uh, classical LPs by all of those those uh, those uh, players, for sure. Later in your education, you studied with John Holmquist at the Cleveland Institute of Music for your Bachelor's of Music. Speaking about him, you've said, I learned a great deal about music from John Holmquist, who I consider to be one of the finest musicians to ever play our instrument. Now, can you describe your experience studying with him after Jeremy Sparks, and what was the difference in and how, what were the new things you were well, learning? Well, I mean, it's, I think for me, it was kind of a thing, again, in hindsight, I couldn't see it at the time, but I needed to move on from Jeremy because I had studied with him for so long, for, for uh, eight, year, eight or nine years, that it was really time to kind of to move on to somebody that was basically performing at a very high level and it had performed at the highest level. Um, so while Jeremy was a you know a fantastic player, he was he was not a solo a soloist, a solo guitarist. He was a member of a quartet, and he tended to choose the parts for himself that were more like the bass line. You know, he was kind of like the bass player of the, of that group. And um, with John, that was my first. Uh, well, that wasn't my first contact with a with a great virtuoso. I mean, my really for me. Uh, having master classes with David Russell at age 11, 13, and 15. I mean, David Russell really became uh, a huge primary influence on me and, and uh, you know, sort of an iconic uh, figure right away. Um, but then to have the weekly lessons to go to, to get into a, a, a top music school like Cleveland Institute of Music and be studying week after week with John was another thing entirely. I mean, that was kind of something where someone could a- would actually demonstrate the things to, to you and be playing it much better than you, and with like uh, with a beautiful sound and tone and execution and and musical ideas and phrasing and so a lot of things about technique, uh, uh, a lot a lot of things about musicianship and phrasing and f- uh, architecture of a piece of music like an architecture of a sonata form. Um, and, and then also a lot of body, like muscle awareness, muscle awareness, joint awareness, breathing exercises. Like he, he studied Tai Chi and Su- and he was into Sufi poetry. And he, I mean, he was very much like, you know, he was kind of, he was, he was very much of his time in that sense in the early nineties, uh, late eighties, that kind of new age movement of, of really where Americans were really first getting into a lot of Eastern, um, cultures and, 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 um, and, and sort of, you know, health and wellness practices. And John was really right in there, you know, and, and, and this was, this stuff was being, you know, shown to us and practiced in our seminar classes. And so that was a mind blowing thing because like <laughs> for me at, at 17 years old as a freshman at Cleveland Institute of Music, like I just never, I had never even seen or heard of anything of, of, of things like that, like a Sufi breathing exercise, you know, or a body trip or something like that, or meditation, you know, tri- you know, med- meditation exercises and that kind of thing. So, so all of that, you know, body awareness stuff was also just, you know, really influential on me. And it's things that I use to this day and teach others, you know, my st- students to this day. Where were you at at 17 years old playing wise? Uh, if you could describe yourself back then, did you consider yourself kind of like, a young, full of fire, uh, up and coming kind of hotshot, and did you have a lot of? Uh, yeah. You mentioned. I, I, I think. In, I think in those days, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. You said I mentioned something. Oh, earlier. you mentioned. No, this is also uh, slightly related. You mentioned in high school you were kind of a, a music snob, and did that translate <laughs> to your attitude as a player? Did you really want to be a great player at seventeen, and did you have that? Yeah, really competitive yeah. No, I fire? wanted to be a great. I, I mean, I wanted to be a great player at age twelve. You know, like I mean, David Russell uh, will tell you that uh, the great Scottish guitarist and Grammy winner. You know, he remembers all of those master classes when I was 13. Like I had, he said, I just had this kind of look in my eye when I look <laughs> back at him when he's showing me something that I like, almost like, you know, I, I you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this. Like I'm going to take this information that you're giving me and I'm going to apply it because I wanted, I very much wanted to be a, a, a great player someday. 
And so, and also, you know, you have to, the, you know, my first public recital, full-length recital, I was age 12 in Buffalo. And from that point until I graduated high school at 16, I had logged in, you know, a pretty pretty good amount of public performance in Rochester, Buffalo, um, and surrounding areas. Uh, and played in a lot of master classes uh, in, uh, and a lot of live radio programs, like live, um, you know, things. So those are really good, you know, things to, that's a lot of, that's a lot of very good live playing experience. Um, so when I was 19 in the GFA, when I won the GFA international competition, which is kind of like our Van Cliburn, if you will, um, <laughs> I had a lot of, public performance under under my belt so it wasn't it wasn't uh, unusual for me at all to perform for an hour so actually the final round of the gfa felt easier to me than the previous rounds because for then I, you could perform for an entire half an hour uh you know which was that that was actually more my wheelhouse by that point at 19 so yeah at 17 when when i got accepted into clear to music um, I had, I had, I think uh, Jeremy had printed out, had typed out a list of my uh, repertoire, and it was about seventy-five pieces by that point. You mentioned the GFA, so just for my audience, that's the Guitar Foundation of America, and so you were nineteen ninety-two. And actually, there's a terrifying story that you've mentioned before on another show about breaking a string in the middle of the finals performance. Could you retell that story? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was the thing. I, I think. Um, yeah, in, in the uh, in the world of classical guitar, it's kind of it's this kind of you know story of of lore. Uh, I think <laughs> it seems it seems because I it must be because I'm reminded of it. You know, I've been reminded of it for 25 years. Um, it it was yeah, it was in the final round, and I had um, I was changing my strings like every couple days. Uh, that, that was, you know, more or less like the kind of, you know, that just, I probably didn't need to, um, but, uh, it was a kind of, I was just, you know, I was really changing strings a lot during those, you know, two weeks to always have like a fresh set of, uh, bases on while I practiced, uh, leading up to the, to the, the competition. Um, and I, and what had happened was I was on my last pack of strings without realizing it. I had actually burned through all of my, my bases. And so in the final round, what I didn't realize was I didn't have any other, I didn't have a backup set of strings. I didn't even know back then that you should save one set of old strings and keep a, keep it in your guitar case. I didn't, you know, this was not something I had ever really needed to encounter before. So, um, my it, ironically, I was playing a very big guitar then, an, an old uh, Ramirez concert model. That in those days, those concert models from the '60s and '70s that Segovia played were an extra long scale, an extra long string length. And um, and I had this set on, and I don't know how long I would have had it on, but the fifth string broke. The the the, the which is unusual because it's usually the fourth string is the thinnest uh, wound bass string. But in this case, the fifth one broke as I was kind of stretching it, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, I, so I would sort of give the string a little bit of a tug um, when you would tune strings down to scordatura, like scordatura, which is an Italian, uh, you know, we use the Italian word scordatura, which means to detune or, you know, so it's kind of you're changing the pitch of one uh, of a string from one pitch to another. It, a lot of guitar players call it drop D, right? And uh, so the drop D tuning, you know, changes the uh, you know the, the the overall tuning of the instrument, and then you've got to tune really tune all six strings to to D major. So I was doing that and tugging on a fifth string, you know, and I started playing, and it broke while I was playing. So I it was it was. So I had just two short movements left in my final round, and it turns out that I had enough time. Like the whole auditorium gasped. I mean, there was like this huge, like audible, like like the wind, like the air got sucked out of the auditorium. 
And it's um, quite unusual to have a classical guitar string snap. I mean, um, they last so much longer than the steel strings. Uh, were you wailing right, away on those? Because you're not bending. Because you're not bending them, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I hit the. Fr- I mean, the last chord of the Ponce Sonata that I was playing on the first movement is, you know, has a you know big roscato at the end, and you know, I mean, I'm sure I hit it with a lot of force, but nothing that would should you know. Nothing that again, like you're saying, nothing that should really, you know, break the string. But it turns out that I had enough time, so I go. I I went off stage. They said, you know, I, there I heard this voice from the, the darkness of the the auditorium that said, uh, uh, Jason, you have enough time to go back and change your string, and come back and and finish as much of your final round as you can. So I went back and I to my case and I didn't have a string. So then I I wasn't actually at that. Before that moment, when the string broke, I mean, I was so probably so stunned that it happened that I didn't know. <laughs> I, I I probably was, I really wasn't. I was really just more of like an attitude of like, okay, well, on to the next thing, or well, you know, here you are, and and then they said, well, you have enough time to go back, and so that was great. That felt like you know another a sort of a, a, a second, another chance. And when I went back and discovered there was no string. Um, the competitor who was after me, who's one of my best friends in the guitar world today, Andrew Zone, he's a great player, great teacher. Um, he lent uh, a fifth string to me, and there was an assistant backstage, and he strung it up really quickly. And I went out, and I was, you know, played the other two movements, tuning the string as I played, because of course, as you can imagine, it was flip, oh no, was flipping <laughs> downward because it had just been put on. Yeah. And uh, played, you know, played the rest of the performance. And, you know, the thing was, it was like that was already all the way through, that was a good performance for me. You know, how, you know, sports athletes, you know, and, and you know, they'd say, oh, well, that was, I was definitely on my A game. Well, all the way up through that per- that point, I was, you know, I was probably playing as well as I could possibly play at that point. So, uh, you know, I think I was putting together a good round and then continued that on after the putting the string on. So I think that maybe in some respect that, uh, you know, I don't know what the, you'd have to talk to the judges or <laughs> you know, find out you know who they were to see what their impressions of it were. But it seemed that, uh, you know, I think maybe what, what it sort of looked like from the outside was, wow, this guy's not phased, you know, really not phased by anything. Um, and, and in fact, there, there was a lot of why I was reminded about it for years after that was some, some people actually asked me if I had planned it, if it was actually <laughs> something that I had done because, because they had heard either from their teacher or they were there and they said, you seemed so calm about the whole thing. It seemed like you were too calm. You didn't even react. You went back, put on the string. We could hear that it was slipping yep. or my, you know, and, and that you, you, there was no, it didn't show on your face that you were the least bit bothered by it. So, um, again, I had so many, I had so much ex- performance experience by that point. I think that that's what was really working for me. You know, I remember playing for, uh, my teacher in Buffalo. Uh, I remember playing for his studio class, uh, during like a really cold Buffalo night. And it was, he was, they were having seminar class. And so he wanted me. He wanted to bring me in because you know by that age, like at thirteen, fourteen, I was already playing, you know, uh, some pretty advanced pieces. And I remember playing something on my you know three hundred dollar guitar, and one of, and one of the strings going boom like that, like it just like it just like the it just slackened, yep. like, you know, like the, it just <laughs> yep. loosened. And I and I remember even at that time, I remember that moment and just. Just, just not not stopping. Just immediately grabbing the string. You know, I stopped obviously the piece. You know, performing the piece for a second, but immediately just just tuning the string back up and then continuing playing as soon as possible. Like the show must go on, type of thing. You know, that I mean, I think that. So I that think almost that attitude, adds to the show. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you certainly don't want something like that to happen. But I think even from an early age, if from twelve, thirteen, fourteen, it was very much like. You know, I was very, I was a very focused performer in that sense. Like, I really, it was very much about, like, you know, the show must go on type of attitude. Let's move on to uh, a particularly interesting physical thing that is very cool that people notice about you is that you use ping pong ball shards for uh, artificial fingernails. So you would take a shard from a ping pong ball and you would attach it yeah. with crazy glue to your fingers. Is it all your fingers or just your thumb? Oh, no, no. It's, it's just my thumb. I've never, I've, 
The only time I've ever used one on a, on one of my fingers was, I mean, I think maybe I had to do this one time in 25 years where I broke my nail. My nails actually don't break very easily. And, and I, I use it on my thumbnail, and my thumbnail doesn't break very easily either. However, my thumbnail, I can't grow. There's a certain length of, of each of a guitarist's right-hand nails. So the right hand is what plucks the string, right? And not only is it your sound, it's, it's not, you know, the, 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 these four plectrums on the string, it, it also... Um, it also is your golf swing, as I as, as I like to call it. You know, it 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 very much is a mechanic that if one nail is not at its optimum length, it can really feel as though, especially at, when at an advanced playing level, it can really feel like you're playing with a different set of golf clubs. You know, like all of a sudden in a tournament, like it can feel very much like like your whole right hand is is off or thrown off uh off balance. And so what I discovered in my early 20s was that having a longer thumbnail just immediately corrected and 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 uh, made much easier uh, easier for me um a lot of uh technical uh a lot of technical things, a lot of mechanical things in terms of speed playing, particularly in arpeggios. But my thumbnail grows out of my um, in such a way that it corkscrews right away, like it's a very heavy kind of uh, dip on on the side. So I could never get it to, I could never get the the length of it beyond the the end of my thumb. And so the ping pong ball was a way to, you know, so like you would use a ping pong ball. The ping pong ball is uh, you, you cut it into like a crescent moon shape, right? And that's the most common substitute for any classical guitarist. I mean, most classical guitarists that are professionals, that any any guitarist that has a high volume of performance to do during the course of a calendar year, most likely is going to have you know a half of a ping pong ball or a few pieces of it in their in their guitar case. That's just in case they they smash their nail on the way to the concert hall. Like you have to have something to you know, just the same way you would have an extra pack of strings. If you broke a string on stage, you have to have something so that the show goes on, you know. Um, so for me, it's more of like a professional necessity just due to the volume that of concerts and rehearsals and pra- hour, practice hours that I have to put in, you know, over the last 25 years since I became a full, you know, sort of full-fledged professional. What I really admire about you, Jason, is you have this really thorough understanding of music. You approach music like a musician, and I, I know that sounds ridiculous to say, but but I notice a lot of, especially the classically trained ones, they tend to just read notes and focus on note-perfect perfection, but you really look at harmony and theory. Let me read this quote that you said. Between my theory training at the Cleveland Institute of Music and all the jazz I was listening to and playing, I could really get into an avant-garde post-punk group like Shudder to Think and have fun analyzing the chord clusters they were using. I was a total music nerd by that point. Still am. So what's wow. your... Wow. When cool. your understanding I like of that quote. <laughs> your understanding of theory, how does that inform your musicianship? Do you look beyond the notes just for the the execution of it? Do you look at the harmony? Do you look at the melody and how they interact with each other? How does yeah, music yeah. theory, at, uh, how is that at, important to you? you? Well, you look at, you're looking at all of it all the time. I mean, that's that's the thing that, that's the, the, the important thing that I have to impart to to guitar students, a lot of times you have to, the, the ones you have to really, really pound home this point with are the most advanced players. Because oftentimes the most advanced players that are in your studio are trying to win competitions. And when you're trying to win a, competitions, a competition, you tend to, in terms of what your focus is, you tend to block out anything other than the notes, than getting the notes without buzzing. And playing playing a round a competition round with as few mistakes as possible, but when you're circling the wagons like that and not you know and and it's it's almost like a kind of a study a kind of a practicing out of desperation, and and so uh, almost like a an austerity where it's like well no we can't we don't have time to do this other stuff right 
So if you're always entering competitions, which I was never in that kind of mold anyway, um, if you're always entering competitions, the tendency is to is to put is to not is you know when you're studying a piece of music or you were working on it to not use that practice time to think about your theory training and what you're studying about you know harmony and melody um, and, and form and structure the architecture of a piece and this kind of thing and to just get to the business uh, every day of playing cleanly. But the problem is, is if that theory is not in your playing and your ear is not well trained and, and you don't develop a culture, uh, a lifestyle, if you will, of looking at that and having an awareness of it with every piece that you study, it shows up in your playing. So you can play a perfect round with, you know, no, you know, no perfect round that really is devoid of musical nutrients, if you will. It's almost like if you take a, if you take broccoli and you just steam all the, you know, like a, you, <laughs> you steam it too long, right? Like you steam all the nutrients out of it or you boil it or something like that. Or you, you know, it's like it, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the, enough of the, the nutrients or the information in the performance. And so, yeah, no, that was something that, again, John Holmquist was very high on that kind of stuff and knew and, you know, basically knew everything about how music was put together. It, it takes a long time to study. And then, again, your practice, you know, I, the way I, you know, I have a very sort of, it's not a, it's not a methodology because I, I modify it according to every student, but I really try to encourage them to take their time in the beginning, uh, the, the initial two, one or two months of studying a piece so that they can absorb as many of those nutrients while, while they're actually practicing the physicality of the piece to go ahead and stir all of those things in at once if they can and just take their time. Because the more of that, it's, that stuff you invest in, you know, in the beginning of it, the more it will be in your playing when you're, when you're done when when it's polished, when when you spend all the physical hours on polishing the the passage work and all the, that stuff, so yeah, no, it's you're right. It's a lot of classical musicians. It ends up sounding a little bit like an athletic event, like an like an athletic, <laughs> which it is. It is very. It's it is extremely difficult. I think a lot of the general population does not understand how just how extremely difficult it is to give a clean performance of a classical piece of music on any instrument. It just, it requires hours and hours and hours. Like you know, I've you know I've probably put in somewhere between twenty five and thirty hours, thought thirty thousand hours of of you know practice uh, in. And some of my students at Curtis and CIM have already are well past their ten thousand hours. You know, if we think about the outliers uh, theory, they're they're well past that. They're like they're already on pace to for you know they're, well, they're almost uh, pushing twenty thousand hours at this point. And they're like in their late teens, early twenties. So, um, yeah. So it's so using those hours wisely is what's going to allow them, in my opinion, to actually have a career beyond the competition phase, to where you're going to be able to collaborate with other artists and be able to play chamber music, and you're not going to have to stop to think and spend extra hours on thinking about or worrying about you know, what, what is the music supposed to sound like or how to interpret it? You know, that's a lot of, a lot of students, uh, that, that want to study with me. They, they say, well, I, I can play, I can play, you know, the pieces I want to play, but I don't know how to interpret them. And that usually upon a further investigation means that they did that, that for whatever reason, there just hasn't been enough hours invested in the music side of their study. I want you to react to a quote that I, I found very interesting in doing research uh, by John Williams, the guitarist. He said, students are preoccupied with fingerings and not notes, much less sounds. Some are able to play difficult solo works from memory, but have a very poor sense of ensemble playing or timing. Right. And he said uh, he encourages, he said, he w instead of playing difficult pieces, he would say play easier Haydn string quartets. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, would you react to that? Oh, he's absolutely one hundred percent correct in my in my opinion. I've read that quote, and I've uh, I've referenced uh, that quote much to the chagrin of many students. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> that is not a popular 
uh, that is not a popular uh, set of quotes there by John Williams to uh, to digest, you know, from from a lot of guitarists because it's very, because to them it feels like a race, you know, that to them it feels like a you know like they're running a race against all these other young guitarists around the world to capture the most uh, prizes, and while that is also important. What he's talking about is like that when they get out of school, when they're done with their bachelor's degree or their master's degree, he's saying that a lot. What he's suggesting is a lot of them are not able to function at a high level, at the same level as their peers in the string and wind, uh, brass, and you know, so on and so forth, as their other counterparts or their other peers in classical music. Now, now there's a bit of an there's a bit of a, an advantage, of course, that a, let's say a string player, a cellist has, is they're often, you know, if they're very serious about classical music, they're often in a youth orchestra. They're, you know, in other words, if you're a string player, you're going to be playing a lot of chamber music from the moment that you start playing. It's just part of the training, and 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 so that's that stuff that to them is like they, they're not. They can't separate the the act of playing ensemble from you know from playing their instrument. It's like a it's it's just part of the deal. And my I credit again my first teacher Jeremy Sparks. I credit him a lot for this because all alongside the studies of the etudes and practicing scales and arpeggios, which he made me you know demonstrate for him weekly, and the concert pieces that I wanted to study and and play. Right. That's that's that was my primary. Uh, you know, uh, goal was to play concert pieces, you know, um, was playing duos with him because he, he probably realized I didn't have an outlet for that sort of thing. And, you know, and, uh, I was probably one of the only classical musicians, uh, you know, uh, in in my neighborhood, if not the only kid <laughs> studying classical music <laughs> in my neighborhood. And uh, so, you know, it's that, that he he uh, regularly, you know, I played lots of duos with him in lessons, you know, and that was basically a chamber music training right from the, the start of my classical guitar training. So, yeah, it's, it's I, what, that quote by John Williams is absolutely spot on. I've, I've, I, I've uh, read that many times. Yeah, he was, he was, he was absolutely, he was absolutely, I think someone like John Williams from his sort of like from his more lofty perch at the time, you know, he was really at the very top of the, you know, of, of the whole thing in classical guitar for many years. So I think when he was visiting, when he would do the occasional master class, I think it, 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 he was a bit um, surprised actually. I think, I think for, I mean, I, I won't speak for him. I mean, you'd have to ask John, You'd have to ask uh, uh, Mr. Williams, but I think like I think he was probably a little bit shocked at the at the lack of musicianship in in the playing. This is a good segue now to talk about your arranging for the guitar because you're known as a great interpreter, but you also make some very tasteful arrangements, such as "In a Sentimental Mood" on your album "Play" or Isaac Albanese's uh, "Sweet Espanola." What is your approach to arranging music for the guitar? Uh, I don't really have an approach. Uh, I just uh, something kind of catches my ear, or I mean, a lot of it is just through professional um, situations where, like the the Ellington arrangement of "In a Sentimental Mood," was actually born out of a of a symphony engagement where I was playing uh, the Rodrigo Concerto, you know, uh, for the hundredth time and. It, but they, that particular symphony, it was in Charlotte. Uh, Sh- Charlotte, it was Charlotte Symphony, North in North Carolina. They um, they had uh, the the program was bookended by American composers by Bernstein. Uh, uh, was the first piece, and then they did the Rodrigo Concerto, which is a Spanish piece, of course. And then at the end, they had something by Gershwin. So they wanted me in the second half to play like a few solo pieces while being interviewed by the conductor on stage, which, mm. you know, this was back in 2000, this was back in 2007, 2008, which is like now all these conductors are speaking from the stage. But back then this was like, oh, this is a pretty cool idea, I think. 
in, in hindsight. He would interview me, and then I was, to, I, in my solo pieces, I, we were to get the audience from Spain back to America, you know, with these solo guitar pieces. So, uh, so I played, I think I played Sevilla by Albanese, right? And then I needed something Spanish or Latin American. And the Latin American music is a lot, you know, South American music is a lot easier to make the transition into jazz because of Brazilian music, right? You know, because of the, the jazz harmonies that are in Brazilian uh, popular music and classical music as well. So I played a Jorge Morel piece, and then I thought, okay, well, there's one, another connector, and I probably had another connection piece in between Spain and, and, and South America. And then from Morel, I could get back to America... You know, I could get back. I could get back to Gershwin through like doing an arrangement of a jazz standard. So that was really what it was, and I and I probably put that arrangement together in about a half an hour, and then spent you know uh, just the bare bones of it, and probably spent another half an hour sort of working out the a little bit of the the um, inner voice uh, details or any little fills or whatever that I was doing, little you know kind of little piano fills or saxophone fills or something that meaning like something that you would imitate on the guitar, you know, bebop licks and stuff like that. Oh, um, it would take a, it would or, take a whole or, other or, interview, I think, to get, really get into that. Uh, I really wish we had more time, but I definitely encourage my listeners to go check out all your works, especially that in, in a sentimental mood. I mean, what an arrangement, so beautiful uh, okay, on your album play. You. Time is running out, so I have just a few quick questions to ask you. The, the one is, I want to get your opinion on improvisation, because you do it. You're, in, you're a very unusual classical guitarist, but you're really such a full-blooded, everything musician. You seem to do it all. You, classical guitarists are not known for improvisation, but uh, you do improvise, right? It, it's something that you can do. Oh, yeah. I love, I mean, I, I love, like, you know, I've, I had the, uh, I had a, I mean, this is one of many examples, I, I, uh, but it just kind of popped into my head. I, I had a master's student um, in the late 90s, uh, Dan LaPelle. He's a very successful classical guitarist, the avant-garde, you know, new music guitarist in New York City. Uh, when he was studying with me, he, we, he would come over. I mean, we were roughly the same age. That was back in the time when I was, like, studying. I was teaching students. I was teaching at CIM from, ni- from 1997 on. And a lot of times, initially, those first few years, I was teaching students who were older than me, which is very odd for me. Um, but you know, the but uh, but Dan and I were roughly the same age, and he would come over, and we you know we'd hang out, and we'd make up a chord progression. We just kind of set out like a, like flamenco sketches off like off of uh, kind of blue or whatever. We just put together like a eight seven seven or eight chords loop it around and we take solos over it or we just read charts together and I learned a lot f- of improvising actually from from Dan LaPelle and I'd pick up stuff along the way and, and in those days I actually got to a fairly uh, professional level of what Pat Metheny would call you know functioning on the bandstand meaning like <laughs> I could I could actually bring my guitar uh, and and my real book and open it up, and if I and someone could call a tune I'd never seen before, and I could, I got to the point where I could, you know, comp the chords underneath the soloists, and then if the leader pointed to me to take a solo, I could even, in some cases, if I felt comfortable. So a lot of times I would shake them off. I would shake the leader off. I'm like, no, like you know, you do it. It's all by eye contact and and body language. And you could shake, you could shake the leader off and say, no, I don't, I don't want to take a solo over this. Um, and, but I got, you know what I mean? Like I got to that kind of thing. That's what, what functioning on the bandstand is, is sort of like you can, you get to that thing, but no, it's very healthy actually for your ear. Um, the, the, the benefits from it, if one can, you know, if, if one is, um, is what, if a classical guitarist is, uh, is so inclined is it really, it does tremendous things for your ear. Uh, and uh, also your knowledge of the fretboard. Your knowledge of your fr- the fretboard goes into another dimension when you have to actually figure out how to play new melodies over a chord progression. And, and, and of course, it ties all of your theory and ear training into one kind of thing as well. The jazz musicians are really, in some ways, the best musicians, uh, Western Western musicians, because you can't you can't play a single note without knowing the entire structure of the tune and how the, how all those musical atoms and molecules are put put together 
there's a very interesting trend now. Um, the the field of classical improvisation is starting to get a lot of interest. And what is your take on classical improvisation or improvisation within the field of classical music? And I'm talking specifically about styles such as the Baroque. Uh, we knew Bach was a famous improviser. Yeah. So was Clementi. What What is your and opinion? Mozart, Mozart too, exactly. I'm sure. What's your take on this uh, trend, this resurgence? Well, I mean, it's not. It's it's really been happening in classical music within the classic within sort of the established classical eras of Baroque playing for a long time, and 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 many many famous pianists have been either writing their own cadenzas or even or improvising their own cadenzas on the classical era repertoire, such as say like a Mozart piano concerto. So that's. That's been alive and well, I think, for a long time. It's just that when I, it's just that when I was a student, the difference now is when I was a student in the conservatory uh, in the early '90s. If a pianist came into Cleveland Orchestra and played their own cadenza of a Mozart concerto without playing, instead of playing Mozart's cadenza, you know, it was, you know, it was a, it was quite a bit of news. Right, you know, at the, in the early '90s, late '80s, that was something, that was really something kind of special. Now it's kind of if someone would do that, I don't think anyone would really blink an eye. I mean, it's because it, also it, it's not that important whether they do it or not. It, 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 I think it's also part of the thing because because of the internet. You know, the, the, once once the late '90s came around with the internet, and then that, and how that really changed the world in so many profound ways. Uh, much the same way that the Industrial Revolution changed the world a hundred years prior, you know, it's or, or so. Uh, I think the internet really, um, over time, over a couple generations of people, changed a lot of attitudes about classical music, and it just seems silly for it to be sort of viewed as this kind of stodgy thing that you only play, you know, like this kind of thing. So improvising your own cadenza or writing your own cadenza. Of a piano, of a classical era piano concerto, uh, and I say classical era because it was encouraged in those days when they were writing it. That's what they did. You know, those guys were mostly improvisers. It wasn't until the late 19th century and the 20th century where the composer became this kind of figure, where it was like the composer was was the 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 last word in terms of what was to be played what notes were to be played, how they were to be played, and this kind of thing. Like, you didn't, you don't change the notes. So that's loosening up again. It's almost like in a weird way we are re- returning to more of a Baroque era mentality or approach that, that the, the performance can be different every time. That this idea of having a definitive performance, oh my God, I mean, Nick, if, I, if <laughs> someone told me I had to play, if I had to perform a box suite exactly the same way every time I would go nuts. I, would, I mean, it would just make, I feel like a robot. You know, it would just be like to go performance after performance of playing it exactly the same way without any deviation. You know, it just, to me, it's just not being, it's not allowing me to, to fully uh, be an artist uh, in, the, in the moment of performance. And I think people are really getting, you know, I think young people are very hip to that right now. Now, the final question, uh, Jason, is can you talk about Pat Metheny's four-movement suite that he's written for you? Did he listen to your Pat Metheny album, and uh, what's your relationship with him? And, and yeah, just tell me about that, that, that work that he's composing. Yeah, that was, that's been a very uh, wonderful friendship uh, for me, and uh, I, I feel very blessed to, to know Pat. And that did start out, that actually happened, again, through kind of a professional situation in the sense that his trio and I were playing on the same classical, uh, basically classical music series in, at the University of Richmond many years ago. This was like uh, 2006 or seven. And I was I was doing a concert with the Shanghai String Quartet, you know, great great string quartet, and they were in residence at University of Richmond. And we went, you know, there's a lot of, you know, on the road, you know, you play your concert and you go out to dinner, you know, have have, you know, have a couple glasses of wine and you and you have a nice meal, right? That's a very kind of normal thing. And um, so we're talking, and and the presenter mentioned that she was bringing Pat Metheny, and I was thinking, and I was like, oh my god, I mean, like one of my very favorite artists, right? 
so I was like, what, when is that? And, and uh, I said, I'm a huge fan. I play, I, I play a bunch of, I've made a ton of arrangements of his music, which she then, of course, was very intrigued by. I got hired shortly after that to do a solo recital, uh, playing a lot of uh, a bunch of those arrangements, right? So, but at the time, I was like, my re- uh, record company and I, Azika Records, we are thinking of recording an entire record of me playing my solo arrangements of Pat Metheny's music. She said, "Oh, well, if you can get here to Richmond next October." Uh, I'll introduce you to Pat, and she's, you know, and, and uh, which was amazing because I thought there would be like a whole line of people coming down to to, to see him, but it was just me, me, and it and turned out it was just me and an NPR reporter, and Pat probably asked me more questions than <laughs> I asked him. I was I was sort of like I, he just immediately walked up to me and, and asked me about nails about fingernails because he grows his fingernails for his concerts because he plays a lot of acoustic guitar and uh, and, uh, plays a lot of he has always he often has a solo uh, spot where he does his own arrangements of his own tunes so he's as a naturally as a guitarist he's very curious as to how these classical guys you know what how they're you know how they're dealing with their nails from gig to gig so I mean, I was kind of standing there dumbfounded because I mean, I, it was like you know, as he was walking down the hallway toward me, he was asking the question as he was walking toward me, and I'm like, it was like Paul McCartney was walking toward me, <laughs> asking me a question, you know, <laughs> so, at the time. But then you know, Pat's such a great, you know, wonderful, you know, warm person that that it immediately kind of disarms you, you know, like you don't, like you you kind of immediately feel like you know you know he's 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 a he's a brother you know like a, a friend and stuff so so there that was kind of how it started started out and he's like oh yeah i can't you know he said um can't wait to hear what you do with the the things and we sent him the first master and he loved it and you know he loved it and wrote you know like a little bit of a you know a, a nice little paragraph for the liner notes and steve Robby, his bass player and co-producer did as well and, uh, you know, and, and he told me that Lyle Mays enjoyed it as well, which was great, you know, because, <laughs> you know, those musicians, those guys I really respect so much as musicians. So, it, and we, you know, he would just keep in touch. He would ask how things are going and this and that kind of, we just sort of keep in touch, you know, um, and uh, it, it just came about that actually, um, it came about, I can't really get into the details of it right now uh, because it involves a couple other organizations. Um, and so I can't really speak too much about it now, but it just came about that he wanted to write this, uh, he, he was being asked to write a solo piece. And, and in the end, he, he said, well, if I'm going to write a solo piece for guitar, I want to write it for Jason. And he called, and so he told me this and I said, well, well, that would be great. <laughs> you know, that would be fine. You know, we he had he had he had been saying, you know, for years, you know, now that he said, I I I know there's some kind of project where we're going to work together. I just don't know what it is or when it's going to happen because Pat is working like five projects into the future at all times. Like, I mean, he's he's just I mean, he's just like an artistic machine. I mean, it's an incredible the the the. the, the how far into the future he's he's working all the time. So, uh, which I also learned a lot from about you know these these folks that are working at that level. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's 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 been really wonderful. The piece is I I think the piece is a monster. I've been practicing it like two to three hours a day right now because he's gonna be, he's gonna record he's gonna be recording uh, recording me and producing me. Uh, in February, like a little over a month, I'm going to be recording this piece, and it's it's very difficult, and so it requires about two to three hours of practice a day. Can't wait to hear it. And uh, Jason, uh, would you just before you go, would you like to mention any recordings or albums that you that the listeners should buy that you've just released or any recent projects? Well, it's I've actually, despite the fact that I haven't released a solo CD since Play. I think what a lot of classical guitarists uh, d- don't know is I've probably been recording more than ever uh, in terms of the actual pace of, of projects. I mean, I recorded the Gina Stera Sonata a couple of years ago. Um, I, we're, we've got a lot of things actually coming out on different labels. Uh, the Jeff Beal Guitar Concerto just came out on this recently. Not just came out, I guess it came out in the fall. 
Um, and uh, I just recorded the Jonathan Leshnoff Concerto with Nashville Symphony on Naxos. So that's coming out in May. Uh, I, uh, the the piece with Pat Matheny is supposed to come out in sometime in the spring or early summer, because yeah, he he wants to he wants to record that and actually get that turned around you know quickly. And my recording with Escher record uh, Escher String Quartet, which we recorded two years ago, it just it was it was basically kind of sitting in the can because I had all these other things coming out with Yolanda and another CD with you know, Yolanda Kononassis, the harpist and the the jazz accordion uh, bandoneon player that I play with Julian Lebro. We had another release after play. So, I mean, there's there's in the last couple years there's been you know kind of, you know a lot of uh, a lot of different stuff and and a lot a lot of stuff going to be coming out this this year um and also i uh i know that anna kiko myers the violinist wants to do a, a, a record uh project with me we're playing our first concert uh tour together this spring and that's very exciting so i mean it's it's a lot of very you know, actually, as I'm sort of talking about it out loud, it's like, gosh, it's a lot. I mean, it's, it's a lot of it's, stuff. It's exciting <laughs> stuff. <yeah. Yeah. laughs> well, I guess that's why. I guess that's why I'm back to practicing like four or five hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, for my audience, please check out Jason's website, jasonvo.com. You can you can get all his recordings there, and you can see his schedule for upcoming dates. Jason, it was such an honor to have you on the show. We'd love to have you again. Oh soon. yeah, thanks, Nick. And I, I you know I saw I saw your I saw you on Twitter. That's kind of how I got to. So I, I I I saw that you know you you've been interviewing a lot of very you know high profile artists. So it's a it's an honor to uh, to be on your show. Yeah, I mean we're so excited to have you on on today. So you're you're definitely in this echelon, and uh, we definitely want to have you back. So Jason, thanks for taking the time, and uh, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks. You too, Nick. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks for listening to my interview with the amazing Jason Vio. What a musician. This is what I do. I get the best musicians in the world and ask them about music. It's so simple. Don't forget to recommend, follow, and like the show on social media. You can also be a supporting listener on Patreon and receive exclusive perks and access our secret Facebook group. Finally, get on the mailing list at NikhilHogan.com. Only good stuff will come your way. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 